Zeke and Luther is a series that aired on the channel Disney XD from 2009 to 2012. It was one of the first shows to be made exclusively for the network, which was a sister channel for the Disney Channel that formed in 09 to appeal to a more masculine audience. I guess you could call it a brother channel then. I'm sorry. Before and during the Bounce and Ribbon era boom of shows like Lizzie McGuire, Hannah Montana, and Wizards of Waverly Place, the Disney Channel had always appealed to different types of viewers, with shows like Phil of the Future, Even Stevens, and The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody also airing at the same time. But with those previous shows, which had massive success in launching multimedia stars of a generation, it led to the channel going all in on tween girl programming, much to the dismay of the boys watching at home. A very binary way to look at things, I know, but when it comes to the creation of shows like this one, this has been how executives think and create these projects. Disney XD was an attempt to create content that was more teen boy oriented, and of course original programming was going to be necessary to capture the right energy. That's where you get shows like Aaron Stone, which flopped, and Crash and Bernstein, which was relatively successful, but at what cost? Cost of my fucking eyeballs, apparently. God, I hate that shitty ass puppet. And for the purposes of our discussion today, Zeke and Luther, which was the first real big success the spin-off network ever really experienced. Oh, oh, oh. Trying to keep the magic alive. Okay. There are a few things I want to clarify with this video. Am I... Do I have too much light in here now? I, I have my light on and the window open, so... Is that- do I look okay? <laughs> I am so clearly not used to filming during the daytime. Uh, the fact that it's not like 3 a.m. right now is kind of wigging me out. I'm not- I'm not used to this. Do you guys like my new background? I spent way too much money on some brand new art, so this background could look nice and cool. So let me just update you on a few things that are going on in my life right now, because it's important to the creation of this video. I'm currently a university student, and the internet is down on campus right now, so I have no way of accessing um, the internet, so that has of course altered the way I had to make this video. Luckily I was able to make the trek down to the local coffee shop with Wi-Fi in it, and the only way I can get clips for this show was from the Disney XD YouTube channel. The first ever videos that the Disney XD channel ever uploaded were Zeke and Luther clips, and apparently this is how a lot of people watched the show originally, was just through clips on Disney XD. The only problem with these clips is that they are in 4x3 and they are in 480p because back in the day that was the highest resolution you could upload YouTube videos in. So while the first season looks nice and crisp and clean, uh, the rest of the show looks like dog shit and I apologize, I really have no other way to provide clips of the show for you because like I said the internet's been out for like a week now and hopefully it'll be back soon but yeah, I have no way of, of getting the clips for you guys, so I apologize. That's also why this video is in 4x3. I wasn't going to make it in 4x3 because the entire show is available to watch in 16x9, but like I said, the clips uploaded to the Disney XD YouTube channel were in 4x3, so it would be weird if just like half the clips in this video were, had, didn't, had, were cropped and the other rest weren't. So we're just making the whole video in 4x3. We're going to have to deal with it. Something that's unique about me talking about Zeke and Luther is that this is the first TV show I have not watched previously to making an analysis video on it, with The Sweet Life on Deck and Wizards of Waverly Place and obviously My Babysitter's a Vampire. I had watched it as it aired on the Disney Channel, but with this show, I never actually saw it. I guess I didn't really watch Disney XD all that often. I only really watched that network when they were doing reruns of shows that I liked, like My Babysitter's a Vampire. I have a crackpot theory that most people actually watched Mabav on Disney XD and not on Disney Channel, because a lot of people remember the kind of spooky bats advertising around it, and that was only done on Disney XD. And the show was actually aired during Halloween time, like it was supposed to be aired. Originally on Disney Channel, Mabav aired all within like the span of two weeks. They aired an episode a day. And and it was during Disney Channel Summer, so all of the advertisements for the first season were in Disney Channel Summer mode. And then Season 2, with the initial success of it on both networks, Season 2 was given the full Thursday night, you know, big epic treatment. And of course that was aired in the fall. Sorry, I just, I have to mention My Babysitter's Vampire in every video. It's kind of like a rule of, of mine. I say all that to say that I never actually watched Zeke and Luther when it aired on TV. And it's not like I avoided it, it's just never really crossed my path. 
I guess you could say I was the target demographic for all of the tween girl TV shows that they were making. And so this show wasn't really for me. The sun just fucking came out. Jesus Christ. The weather outside today is really weird. I live up in the mountains now, so some days it's like snowing and other days it's like 70 degrees out. It's, it's quite odd. But other than all of that, I am very excited to get into this video with you guys. So let's talk about Zeke and Luther, the best show ever. Something that I don't think Disney learned early on for Disney XD was that their golden age of Hollywood style of cross promoting that creates brand recognition was what really led to Zeke and Luther's initial success. At least in my opinion. I mean, did the Aaron Stone guy ever appear in a DCOM? Did the Bernstein guy from Crash and Bernstein ever show up in an episode of Zack and Cody? I think not. The cross-promotion is what got stars like Selena Gomez and Demi Lovato their initial success, and that was also the case for the two leading men in the show, Hutch Dano and Adam Hicks. Sure, they weren't Miley Cyrus levels of recognizable, but people knew who they were from their guest spots in other Disney Channel shows and leading roles in DCOMs, like Den Brother and Lemonade Mouth. With Disney XD's launch in 2009, which explains the extremely old internet name, by the way, Aaron Stone was the first original programming to air on the network, and like I said earlier, it flopped. Zeke and Luther was the second, and performed a lot better, just by considering the fact that it got more than one season. These were also the two only shows that got their own Disney Channel wand IDs, which is a pretty big deal in my opinion. There are also plenty of Zeke and Luther bumpers that they made as supplemental content that has actually been archived by Disney XD themselves, because they uploaded a lot of clips of Zeke and Luther onto their YouTube page back in 2010. So Zeke and Luther was clearly created to capitalize on the success of X Games and other extreme sports that young kids were really into at the time. I wonder if the show ever inspired any kids to pick up a board, because if they did, I think that's pretty cool. It also probably got a lot of kids to slap each other in the face on the school playground, and I think that's pretty cool as well. The show follows two characters whose names you might already know, and their antics as they get up to living life and attempting to become professional skateboarders. A lot of their motivation throughout the series involves them trying to get money for better gear so they can become better skaters, and wanting to become better skaters so they can get sponsored and live up to their icon, Tony Hawk. As the show goes on, they grow as boarders and get closer to achieving their goals, with a bunch of fun, silly antics to do along the way. The beauty of a show like Zeke and Luther is that it only ever promises to show the audience a snapshot of their lives, with the silent acknowledgement that their story didn't really begin with the first episode, and it won't come to a conclusion with the final one. It really is a joy to watch these California dudes skateboard all day and have no responsibilities or consequences. The show being wish fulfillment only really occurred to me in the final season for some reason. I can see that the whole appeal of Zeke and Luther is portraying on screen the life that any young kid would want to live. That of hanging out with your friends all day with the best weather possible and not having to go to school. These characters only attend class like four times over the span of three seasons, and I couldn't be any more happy for that fact. One of the big noticeable things about Disney Channel shows when you watch them after becoming a grown-up is that no matter how interesting or unique the premise is, there will always be a giant mudslide of episodes where the characters just attend middle school or high school. They follow stock plots that could be inserted into any show and are mainly there to rest on their laurels until the next event episode that is actually about the premise they promised you in the opening titles. Zeke and Luther is mostly nothing like that. Zeke and Luther promises you a show about teens skateboarding, and you get teens skateboarding nonstop. Trust me, there are plenty of archetypes and cliches in this show, but surprisingly enough, they do a decent job of highlighting the fact that, yes, they are relying on a trope of sitcom history, and, I mean, that doesn't stop them from doing it in the first place, which is its own problem, but it is kind of nice to see some sort of self-awareness from the writers about this kind of thing. So the timeline for Zeke and Luther is pretty weird, in all honesty. When I first started watching the show, I just assumed the characters were the same age as the actors, which was a rookie mistake on my part. If my math is correct, they were probably around 17 years old when they started filming the show. And I mean, they look like 17 year olds, that's for sure. So as I was watching the first few episodes, I decided to go on IMDb and just, you know, do a little general look through on the, on the TV show. And I found out the characters are supposed to be 15. And for some reason that really shocked me. I was like, there's no way these actors are playing 15 year olds. But I mean, 
it was true. It is very common with kids TV shows who have actual child actors to be playing one or two years younger than their actual age. So I fully should have expected this. I don't know why I thought they were going to be that old anyways. Disney Channel shows never follow people into their late teens and early 20s unless the show runs for a very long time. Like Good Luck Charlie is an exception, not the rule. But yeah, it still shocked me. It still, <laughs> I still wasn't prepared for it at all. So then I thought, like any other Disney Channel show, that each season would be a year of their lives, and they would be, you know, 17, 18, ready to graduate high school by the end of the series. But no, I was wrong. Near the end of season two, when they're starting to progress the whole, like, we want to get sponsored plotline, uh, we find out that they're 15 and a half, which means that all of the first season, if I believe that they were 15 at the start of the show, took place only over, like, six months. I was willing to believe that the timeline was accelerated because... You know, theoretically, these characters are supposed to be going to school, and this show is supposed to take place over, you know, the entire year, not just the summer. Originally, I thought maybe it was going to be a Phineas and Ferb situation, where it's like, this show only takes place during their summer vacation. But no, it takes place year-round. There's a Halloween episode and a Christmas episode. And since the show is set in Gilroy, California, which I'm pretty sure is a fake town, that means it'll, of course, look nice and bright and sunny year-round. So, you know, them actually only filming within four to five months, but it taking place over a whole year would make sense. So if the show is taking place over a whole year and we understand that they do go to school because in the very few episodes we get where they do go to school, you know, they're attending classes, not like they're homeschooled or just exist in a world where they don't need to go to class or anything. So if they're going to school, then I always just assumed that all of these episodes took place over the weekends or before and after school and that we would just, you know, cut away for them going to class and then it would be done with. And I mean, it's not that I'm wrong about that necessarily. It just, it just changes a lot of things to think that this has only happened over six months. Maybe they're supposed to be 14 at the start of the show, which is even less believable, but whatever. Sure. So if they're 15 by season two, then that makes sense because they say multiple times throughout season three that they are 16 years old. But their ages are never confirmed in season one, which is why when I read the show description on IMDb and it said 15, I thought they were going to be starting out at 15. Which means that the whole show only takes place over around one to two years, which is kind of unbelievable for me. Because early on in season one, we get a Halloween episode. And then the season two finale episode is a Christmas episode. So would that mean that the entirety of season one and season two took place only over like two, three months? That's bizarre. It would only make sense if they were 14 at the start of the show and it had been a full year and it was next year's Christmas and it wasn't within the same year. Although I guess if you're literally following every single day of their lives, like they say in the series finale, then sure, that would make sense because then we're only seeing like 40 days of their lives in between the Halloween episode and the Christmas episode. So like that's exactly the same time. Wow, so maybe they did plan for that then. But then when do they go to school? I, I like that they don't go to school. I hope I make that very clear. I would much prefer if they never attended class. And the few episodes where they do have to go to a high school and they're in class were always very upsetting to me because I like the wish fulfillment of these douchebags never attending class ever. And whenever they talk about school, they're absolutely floundering and failing at it. It's a nice charm of the show. So I'd rather they just never acknowledge the fact that school exists and we just assume they have no parents and no you know, responsibilities at all. Or they kept the timeline consistent with the fact that they do attend school and all of these episodes take place outside of the school hours. So for like eight hours of their day, they're not skating and we don't get to see that moment of their lives. But like, that doesn't really matter. It doesn't change the day-to-day -day aspects of the show. It doesn't ruin anything. I am so sorry. If I knew this was going to be the case, I wouldn't have been filming on camera. Jesus Christ. I was initially just very happy with the fact that they seemed to be taking care of the timeline early on in season one. After the Halloween episode, we see a Don's Donuts employee of the month, like, yearly calendar, and we see that it should be around November. So that means that, like, yes, things were actually progressing in the show. But then it does get dropped in season two. As much as I like season two, and I do think it's my favorite season, just from the quality of the episodes, I guess. They changed so much of what they initially set up in season one for a reason, again, I still don't get, like, why? Because besides Zeke and Luther, why does every other character have a completely different personality? Why is Don's Donuts Hooters now? And then why is the timeline so goddamn different? I guess that can prove what makes the show so enjoyable at the end of the day, because it doesn't need to pay attention to character development or timelines or really anything that would make the show cohesive 
throughout multiple years, all it needs to do is within a 22 minute span of time, just provide entertainment for you. And I mean, it does that. So I don't really need it to, to do all of these things. It's just that they set up a lot of stuff and then they didn't pay it off. It's the Sunny with a Chance situation all over again. But I'm way more forgiving of this show than I am with Sunny with a Chance because Sunny with a Chance was also just bad in general. Like each episode that didn't have all of these flaws were also just not as fun to watch. There was maybe only like two episodes out of that whole show that I actually liked. Versus Zeke and Luther, which for the majority of the time I was watching the show, I was having a good time. There's only really two or three episodes that I would say aren't good. Season one is such a unique experience to throw yourself into without any context, especially compared to other Disney Channel shows of the time. The show is a single camera on location show, with specifically a majority of the series taking place outside. The really early episodes were so jarring for me to watch since this show was nothing like the other TV shows I've covered on this channel before. I don't really know what I was expecting since a series like this could never really work in a multi-camera sound studio setting, but I think season one is the most intense when it comes to its style and editing, which is why it felt so drastic to me when starting for the first time. Both of these elements do get toned down as the show goes on. Every five seconds there was a jump cut, they were outside a majority of the time, usually relying on natural sunlight, and the camera very rarely cut away when a gnarly stunt went down. So much of cheap Disney shows like this one rely on sound studios and minimal locations to try and smokescreen a lack of diverse sets, with the occasional fake as hell looking park or brand new diner to never be seen again. It's not like Zeke and Luther didn't have this lack of budget, I honestly believe the first season was shot entirely on two pennies and a pile of shoestrings alone. So they were leaning into the style of the editing and camera work to try and smokescreen it that way. With the cameraman seeming to not have a tripod during the dialogue moments, to the extreme jump cuts mid-sentence, and the general talking to the camera, it honestly felt like I was watching a YouTube video from the late 2000s or something. I mean, this show probably had the same budget that most Smosh videos would have, so... There you go. If I were to splice together clips from season one of this show to random Smosh videos from a decade ago, I'm almost certain that people wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the two. I will say that a lot of the skating special effects look pretty good, which makes me think that whatever budget they did have mostly went to stunt doubles and camera rigs to catch their awesome boarding, which I'm glad that something like that took priority in this show, considering the whole conceit of it is skateboarding. Seasons two and three do seem to get a higher budget, or at least they're doing something different with the camera now because they do slightly stray away from this form of style into something a little more different. And over time, you get used to the new normal the series establishes. Each season has its own unique style that it adopts as the show decides what it wants to be for the current moment. There isn't really a lot of brand consistency across the entire show when it comes to anything that isn't Zeke or Luther, and even that can get muddied sometimes. What makes season one a little bit weird is that episode four is titled Pilot, I'm almost certain that on Disney Plus, all of these shows are in broadcast order and not production order because, I mean, obviously, the pilot episode was the first one they made. It makes complete sense once you actually watch the full season. After episode four, there's around a three to four episode string of just like kind of weak episodes, and it makes me think that they produced four episodes in total at the beginning of the series, and then once it got greenlit, they made the rest. Olive Girl is a good example of that. Her name is Olivia, but she's a model for Langley Olives, so I just call her Olive Girl. I mean, they named her fucking Olivia, so like, what, what am I gonna do? Not call her Olive Girl? I'll talk a little bit more about her later. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. But she's featured pretty heavily in the pilot episode. And then for those next four episodes, she's in pretty much all of them. So my theory is that they made four episodes before they got the order for the full season, and with this original premise, they had Olive Girl pretty heavily included. But then once they got greenlit for the full season, they decided to drop her character and her story arc and stuff. My theory to this is that if they were going to give a love interest to Zeke so early on and do a will-they-won't-they with it, then that would split the two characters into A-plots and B-plots for many episodes. And I mean, the show was called Zeke and Luther, so you'd expect for every episode, Zeke and Luther would be together. The episode where we actually follow and develop on the relationship between Olive Girl and Zeke, Luther has to do something else in the B-plot. So I can see them making that episode of being like, we don't want the rest of the show to be like that. We need the two characters to be doing the same plot together. And if we have Zeke's romantic interest, that's going to be a problem. So they just, they just axed Olive Girl. They cut her out of the show. Maybe they thought to introduce this kind of plot line because other shows did this just well. Like The Sweet Life on Deck, for example. But the whole conceit of Zack and Cody was that they were polar opposite twins. They, it followed that trope. 
So as the characters grew older and they developed more as people, there were multiple episodes where they did not interact at all. And that worked perfectly fine for that show. They didn't need to be together in every plot line. But for this show, you, you kind of need them to be <laughs> in every plot line together. So that's, that's my theory as to why Olive Girl was axed. And then because of that, the four episodes they made with her in it were all pushed together into one string to kind of like start and conclude the, the storyline within all one time. So not to confuse people who are watching at home. She comes back like two more times at the end of the season and then that's it. She's gone <laughs> for the rest of time. The last episode she shows up in is with an Australian guy uh, who tries to woo her affections away from Zeke. I wonder if Austin Butler had to hire a vocal coach to get rid of this accent from this episode. <laughs> that's a timely reference that's not gonna age well. Other than that, season one does a pretty good job. After the first episode or so, you start to adjust and root yourself into the show's new style, only for the next season to come in and upend all of that. Season two is actually probably my favorite season because it seems to manage this sort of simple style of season three with the extreme epic editing of season one. It's clear that they got a higher budget because of the new sets and better props. Things like this don't seem to be that big of a deal until you realize they have multiple episodes where there's a giant pit that appears and one of the guys decide to jump over it. And you realize that the most these boys could do before is skate down some stairs or jump off their roof. Season 3 takes a much more literal approach to the entire idea of the show, and that statement will make more sense in a little bit, don't worry. To me, it's clear that they went back to season 1 and tried to recapture some of that energy, but in a slightly different twist, because season 2 definitely abandoned a lot of the characteristics of the series for a reason I can't quite understand about that yet. But we'll get more into that when we talk about the characters. One of the biggest quirks about the show is that Zeke and Luther talk to the camera. They fully break the fourth wall in every episode and explain to the audience what they're doing and their feelings at the current moment. It's yet another unique aspect of this show that sets it apart from other Disney Channel projects. Season 3 makes the bold choice to have these moments be explained in-universe by making the entire series a reality TV show that the two are filming and archiving to later show the world once they make it as big celebrity skateboarders. I don't like this decision for many reasons, the only important one being that I thought it was just funny that Zeke and Luther alone were the only people who had power of talking to the audience and materializing certain objects to make jokes better or explain the situation. I mean, it's kind of clear that this was always what they intended from the beginning, but when it comes to trying to sell more zany kind of gags, it really came across more as this is just this own little universe they get to play around in for me. Not like they knew they were in a TV show or anything, just that they were the centers of this universe and everything revolved around them. More like Homer from The Simpsons and less like The Truman Show. I think their voice as characters is what shines the most in this show, so being able to talk directly to the viewers highlights that aspect in a very intentional and fun way. Also, it makes them seem even more like YouTube videos, which I guess makes sense since in-universe these guys get their first ever sponsorship at the end of season 2 from going viral from uploading skating clips of them online. In the series finale, we see that all of the episodes we've been watching are actually on DVDs in a giant case in their <laughs> garage. What they should have been doing was uploading these to YouTube the whole time. They would have, you know, been one of the first ever vloggers. Normally I would talk about the two main characters separately, but since this show is about the two of them together, I'm going to talk about them together. In retrospect, I could have done this with Zack and Cody as well when I made a video about them, but like I said earlier, the whole initial appeal of that series was the opposite twins trope. So that's why analyzing them separately was needed back then. I wasn't expecting to reference Zack and Cody so much in this video, by the way. I guess that's just the only other male-led Disney Channel show I've reviewed up to this point, so I feel the need to compare it. Disney XD definitely used the Sprouse twins in a lot of their bumper promotions, that's for sure. Something that can happen in shows like this is making the two leads basically the exact same person, but luckily, even from the beginning, these two had their own distinct and separate personalities, even if they were mostly similar in their interests and mannerisms. Again, like earlier, the only thing to remain relatively consistent throughout the entire show is Zeke and Luther, which makes sense since the show is about them and them alone, other characters being written consistently from episode to episode be damned. I wasn't expecting or even wanting character growth as the show went on, but they very subtly changed their actions and behaviors over time in a way that felt realistic and consistent to their initial setup. 
Zeke was always the more grounded and level-headed one of the two, and Luther was always the more aggressive and goofy one in most episodes. In my mind, I used to joke that Zeke was the stoner skater to Luther's more monster energy drink skater, but I don't think that's what they initially intended. In general, Luther's intensity and aggressiveness is an element of the show that is only ever quietly acknowledged, but was very apparent and noticeable to me as I watched. He's always the fun-loving and cheerful guy, but can and will throw down if he needs to. He's very impulsive and immature, and I mean, so is Zeke, but only up to a certain point. Zeke does grow in intensity over time as his passion for skating grows and he gets older and they get closer to achieving their dreams. Zeke is a very competitive person who was also the sorest of sore losers, so that's mainly when he gets to be a shit kicker the same way that Luther is in most episodes. I always liked how the two were never portrayed as underdogs or bad at skating or anything like that. They always seemed to be popular at school and were always shown working out and practicing different tricks so they can stay on top of their game. Yes, they had room for improvement in season one, but they were already considered good enough to start in their career, and it was just their maturity levels that could get in the way. I was just very nervous when I first started watching this show that we were going to have to follow these complete idiots, absolutely flounder at being even slightly good at skating, and that their dreams of going pro were just absolutely beyond anything they were capable of, because... I mean, it wouldn't have been fun to watch. So the fact that they like are actually capable of skating means that they can do a lot of really cool stunts in the actual show, and it, it gives them something to do. It gives them momentum in the story. Even though the story doesn't really matter all that much to Zeke and Luther, it's just what they're getting up to in the day-to-day -day antics, I still think it's very important. So it was something I really appreciated. Their maturity levels is what I mainly noticed when season 3 hit, because Zeke seemed to step up in maturity once they got sponsored by Riot Skates at the end of season 2. And Luther only seemed to flounder in youthful dissonance as the episodes went on. It probably wasn't as noticeable over the span of 3 years, but watching this show in 3 months led to itself being an obvious shift between the two once the show started quietly wrapping up. They were always very similar to one another before, but by the end of the show, those distinct traits morphed into real and concrete conflicts of character, and I really thought this was set up on purpose so they would attempt to resolve it at the end, but they don't really do that. In previous seasons, when the characters would do something irresponsible, they would both have that turn of heart and eventually do the right thing in the end. Near the end of the show, however, Zeke always does the right thing from the very beginning, and it's Luther that needs to learn the lesson and be there for whenever the plot needs to wrap up. It can lead to so many of these episodes feeling like the Luther learns a lesson show, and it's something I really grew to dislike as the show finished up. Zeke's competitiveness also never really gets a resolution over time. They set up in multiple episodes that he is terrified of losing and has a complex about winning every award he goes for. How they solve this character flaw is just by having him win everything so they don't have to breach this topic again. Zeke becomes skater god by this point, nailing literally every trick and beating even long-term veterans on his first try. I like that they're talented skaters and everything, and I guess they messed up enough in the early seasons to prove that they weren't invincible or armored with plot talent alone, so I guess Zeke is just that talented at skateboarding now. It just takes away any of the stakes for Zeke's character in the later season, and they didn't fall back on the emotional to provide tension like I thought they would, so Zeke just kind of floats in his epicness and stagnates as a character. I guess that was a sign that the show was ready to be wrapped up finally. The series finale is less to be desired for that specific reason, to quote the eternal words of Todd in the Shadows, they spent so much time trying to be big that they forgot to be good. Early on in season 3, there was an implication that there was going to be a large amount of change in the show. Zeke gets horribly injured during a practice run for a big showcase, and the two show some actual emotions other than just gleaming the cube for once. That's a skateboarding term, by the way. Yeah, I did my research. Also, that's the name of a movie that Tony Hawk was in, so... I don't... Anyways. <laughs> the next episode where Luther has a crush on a girl shows a more tender side of him, and from there I thought the show was gonna roll with this emotional maturity that crescendos into the finale. It doesn't though, we just get some more fun and good episodes that could have been in any other season, which was what I was expecting from them before all this development had happened in just two episodes. That's why it was so weird to watch them backpedal so hard. Maybe it was something to do with the ratings or the audience retention, who knows. Either way, 
inconsistency is something that I grew to expect from ZNL, and it's not even something that bothers me all that much. I mean, again, Sunny with a Chance situation where you could have done something cool and you didn't, but that doesn't really matter. They still have a lot of really fun moments within the show where this sort of conflict of character doesn't actually affect the everyday antics of the show all that often. And that is very apparent with the side characters who consistently change in personality and livelihood over the span of these three seasons. To get into the other characters for a little bit, they matter so little to the entire show and are really only set dressing for Zeke and Luther, which makes sense honestly. If you look at the main credits for the first two seasons, other than Zeke and Luther, the other two characters that are in there are Kojo and Ginger. Kojo is supposed to be their frenemy of sorts. Early on, I think what they were planning to do with him was that he was someone who was not superior in talent, but was further along in the going pro career than the other two were. In the first few episodes of season one, he is sponsored by a skating company, but that is dropped relatively soon, and he eventually just becomes their frenemy who is shit at skateboarding, but thinks he's much better than them and has a massive ego. Kojo is honestly one of the best characters to watch in the show. I'm surprised that he's not in it as often, considering he's billed as a main character. He shows up the same amount of times as like Ozzy does in most seasons. And I think that's weird because I don't think they were planning to do as much with Ozzy as they ended up doing. Just to be brief with Ozzy, because I really don't think he matters that much, but they use him a lot as the show goes on. He's supposed to be a power walker. I guess, and is generally a very weird and eclectic kind of guy. Originally, the two guys were supposed to absolutely hate him and despise him, and he never even skateboarded at all. He barely learned how to stand and move on a board by the end of season one. But also, throughout season one, they did a good job of setting up this sort of core four. Like, yes, it's Zeke and Luther, but also... Ozzy and Kojo were the other two who would join them in group antics, and I really thought they were going to go with this a lot more. They had really done a good job of of making the four of them seem like a a great little quartet, but when season two rolls around, they immediately revert him back to season one status, and the two of them hate him, and they have to grow to like him again. It was just so weird to see. It, It wasn't really something I was expecting at all, because I didn't like Ozzy in the beginning, but they had worked with him enough to make me tolerate him in episodes, and then they just sent it back to square one, and I was like, what's going on here? But overall, I wish we had more of Kojo. Again, I completely forgot that he's supposed to be a main character, because in season three, for like half the season, he's not in any episodes at all. The only time you'd see him were in the opening credits. And they do something similar to Ginger as well as the show goes on. Ginger was always the most important main character other than the two that the show is named after. She was Zeke's little sister, and she was pretty much exclusively there for the B-plots. Because, like I said, Zeke and Luther were always supposed to be handling the A-plots together. Occasionally they would separate, but the status quo was the two of them doing things together in the A-plot. So Ginger was there to handle the B-plot. Occasionally you'd get a Kojo or an Aussie B-plot, but... Ginger was really the other half of the show. Ginger even has her own rogues gallery of characters because she was pretty important early on in the show. She had her best friend Poochie. Yes, the character's name is Poochie. I don't know why. And Stinky Cast, who I liked really early on and then grew uh, to despise as the show went on. She's pretty important to the first two seasons and is in pretty much every episode. But then once season three rolls around, again, they quietly cut her out of the show. I didn't even notice early on because things seemed to be the same with her character, but they removed her from the opening titles for season three. And by around episode five or six, she's completely gone and we don't see her until the very end, until one or two more episodes. So they did a very good job of writing her character off. And I guess I can kind of understand why. Early on, I thought they were going to focus a lot more on, again, them growing up and getting older and maybe even more relationship elements. So they wanted to not deal with the younger characters as much. And they even did as much as making 
Zeke move out of his bedroom and into the garage, so he literally would have no reason to be in the main house set anymore, because him and Ginger shared a bathroom and their rooms are right next to each other. So now he's not even in the main house anymore, so they don't have to worry about people questioning, hey, where's Ginger? But I did. I wonder where Ginger is all the time. I wonder if Ryan Newman just didn't want to be on the show anymore, or if this was a conscious character choice, like I said earlier. Either way, it's just generally kind of weird because she was so important in season one, and then she just disappears <laughs> as the show goes on. A little joke I made in my mind as I was watching season two was the Zeke and Luther multiverse theory. I was going to have a whole bit where I got into it in this video, but eh, I decided it's not really that necessary. The theory was that Zeke and Luther were like Rick and Morty universe jumpers, and every episode they would wake up in a different universe, which would explain why certain characters are just completely different from any given moment. So like, for example, in the season one finale, Ozzy is supposed to be like a stereotypical nerd, and he's in like a bow tie and a button up t-shirt, but he's very consistently only shown wearing a tank top and short shorts because he is a power runner. For that episode, it can just be like, well, they were in a different universe where Ozzy's more of a stereotypical nerd instead of like in a power suit all the time. There's also Kirby Cheddar, who is one of the like side younger characters who is constantly getting ragged on throughout the entire show. He's described as having extremely strict parents and lives a very boring, lame life. Also, you're supposed to laugh at the fact that he gets injured all the time. Like he's attacked by a fucking shark in the season two premiere episode. Yes, the episode titled Zeke Jumps the Shark, because why not, I guess? Let's just use that phrase completely unironically now. But in the Christmas episode, which technically is the season two finale, but very obviously just visually was filmed during the season three block, Kirby Cheddar is supposed to be like this spoiled rich kid whose parents get him everything he wants and he lives in a huge mansion. So that's Zeke and Luther in a different universe. That's all, that's all I can say about that. Also, maybe those four episodes from season one where Olive Girl is in there is just like another universe again. And so we mostly spend time in the primary universe where she never moved in next door. And Austin Butler does not have an Australian accent and doesn't haunt me in my dreams. That's all I have to say about this section. Uh, let's wrap up this video. I'm sorry if this isn't as <laughs> organized as a lot of my other videos have been in the past. Zeke and Luther set out to do one thing, and they succeeded in doing that one thing, which was make a very epic and awesome skateboarding show that would attract a lot of viewers to Disney XD, and it definitely did that. When scrounging for clips of this show on the Disney XD YouTube channel, I found pretty much all of the bumpers from around this time just uploaded to their channel, so that's very cool. I'm glad that those are still archived. The only sad thing about that is that now all of the videos are set to YouTube Kids, so we can't see the comment sections, so there's probably thousands of comments from children back in the day that were just deleted. But maybe that's for a good thing. When looking through all of these bumpers, I realized that Zeke and Luther was like, the channel's main squeeze for the longest time. They specifically made a song with Daniel Curtis Lee and Adam Hicks for the summertime kind of advertising, and it samples the song In the Summertime by Mungo Jerry and unfortunately is an absolute bop. I'm so pissed at how often this song has been stuck in my head, and they actually feature it in an episode of Zeke and Luther, and I didn't know originally that this song existed, so I was like, is that Adam Hicks rapping <laughs> randomly in an episode? So Zeke and Luther was really the first ever Disney XD success, and they didn't really go on to have a lot more <laughs> from what little research I have done. I mean, a few Disney XD original shows were popular, but I don't think anything up to the same level as Zeke and Luther's success. Now, I can't be a silly boy and forget Pair of Kings. I mean, obviously that show had two really big Disney Channel stars pairing up together and also later Adam Hicks. So th the fact that I didn't mention Pair of Kings in this video at all up until right now is kind of impressive. That was also a very big Disney XD show. So, you know, Disney XD had a few successes and Zeke and Luther was one of the few <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. This video has just been an excuse for me to talk about Hutch Dano because he's my current celebrity crush. He just has a great beard, what can I say? That concludes this video, guys. 
This whole time I've been drinking Virgil's Root Beer Special Edition Bulvarian Nutmeg. It kind of tastes bad, but that's fine. By Virgil, do they mean like Virgil the Roman poet? Am I gonna start getting visions of the Aeneid after this? I sure hope not. Thank you for watching, I really appreciate it. This has been one of my favorite shows to do a video on, honestly. I was not expecting to love this show as much as I did. So far, I haven't decided whether I'm gonna fully commit to titling the video just best show ever. Um, but that's that was kind of the joke I had made for myself while watching this series. Um, I would when I would tell my friends about this show, I would always say Zeke and Luther best show ever. Like it was the the full title of the show every single time because I genuinely was just so in love with it. Just a few things at the time of me recording this, I'm almost to 800 subscribers, which is very exciting to me. I never thought I was gonna get that many this quick. So my 800 subscriber special is gonna be me watching and reviewing every Cinderella story movie because there are six of them. I know, I only knew about the ones with Hilary Duff and Selena Gomez, but no, there's four more after that. So if you want to see that video, make sure to subscribe. Also, maybe give me some suggestions for other Disney Channel shows you want me to review. Even the bad ones. I'll watch them, clearly. Mentally, I was referring to Sunny with a Chance when I said that joke. Not this one, because this is one of the better ones that I've reviewed. Probably the best show I've reviewed so far. Sweet Life on Deck is, is close. Obviously, Mabav is in a whole other stratosphere, so that doesn't count. Like I said earlier, I'm going to be reviewing and ranking every Disney Channel original movie. So leading up to that video, because it's going to be huge, so it's not going to be able to come out until like December, hopefully. Because of that, there are some DCOMs that I'll want to describe and talk about in more detail that I can in that video. So for the rest of the year so far, it seems like we're only going to be talking about Disney Channel original movies. I already have the whole setup. The next video specifically, I think, is going to be about Geek Charming. I read the whole book, as you can see here. I have uh, plenty of notes that I've taken on it, so we're going to do an adaptation review of that series. But yeah, leave suggestions for TV shows you think I should review next. I'll only do the ones that I find really interesting, of course. Like, if you guys tell me to watch fucking, I don't know, I'm with the band, and I watch the first few episodes and I'm bored as shit, then I won't review it, of course. So that's about it. Like I said... Thank you for watching, I really appreciate it, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!